This session is titled Officer Recruitment. And at this time, I will turn things over to our presenters. Hello, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak. I'm Chase Weatherington. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about my topic for roughly 10 minutes. Um, and then Dr. Cunningham will be speaking about her topic. And then obviously we'll take questions um, at the end if there are any. Um, so again, I'm Chase. Um, what I what I want to focus on on my time here um, and what I've done a lot of research on is law enforcement, uh, formal academic educational hiring requirements and um, disciplinary issues. Um, obviously, as you can see, um, I graduated from Walden um, Criminal Justice Homeland Security and Coordination um, at the end of 2018. Um, Dr. Jesse Lee, who's here, he was my um, dissertation committee uh, chair. So I really appreciate him and all the things he did and helped me um, you know, get through that. And, and the reason why I'm here is because of him. Go to the next slide, please. All right, so why did I uh, look into this problem while I was interested? Um, I myself am in law enforcement for about 11 years now, and I'll talk more about where and things like that. So that was always a focus for me. Um, and when I started looking to these things, when I was working on my um, PhD in 2016 and 17, um, is, is kind of looking at, okay, what can law enforcement do um, to improve um, themselves and work with the community better? And so the social problem that I identify that I wanna look, look into is lack of formal education in law enforcement. Um, there's a lot of research, there, there, just like any other subject, there's research that kind of conflicts, um, but there's always an interest by some agencies to think, okay, do we need more education um, requirements uh, for our applicants? That way we have less problems. Is it not necessary? Things like that. So that's what I wanted to look into. Um, and again, as, as I put, there's just not a lot of research on it. Um, looking at, you know, yes, we have requirements, but how does it, is there any impact as far as disciplinary issues, the severity or the numbers? Is there not any kind of relationships? Um, there really isn't a lot. Um, and then also I wanted to look at it, um, specific controlling for other characteristics such as age, race, military service and whatnot. Um, and the reason, again, why I focused on this is because agencies always want to mitigate issues, um, just like any other business. You want to, you can't eliminate uh, liabilities and things, but you want to try to lessen their impacts. I um, mean, anything you can do on the front end uh, to try to select the perfect candidate, if you will, um, is obviously something that agencies across the country want to do. And I think it's always every agency's goal to hire the best people. That way, the relationships that are building with the community are that much stronger. Next slide. Okay, so again, th this is something that I, I could probably spend hours talking about, um, but unfortunately, we have a limited amount of time. Uh, so on some of these things, I'm, I'm going to have to kind of uh, shorten my explanation, but if we have any questions, that's great. Um, I did this in a, in a quantitative non-experimental analysis, um, again, trying to see if there was any causation or correlation between the edu educational hiring requirements of agencies and then also the frequency of disciplinary issues. Now, there's two ways to kind of go about looking at disciplinary issues. As you can see, I focused on the frequency. Um, there are other studies that looked at severity, um, but there are they're basically two types of studies. And I focused on the, uh, the frequency and, and I'll kind of go over um, other studies that reference the severity. Um, but in this case, I looked at frequency. Um, and the way that I did those analyses, um, I, I used the Spearman correlation uh, to see if there's any correlation, obviously, and then a negative binomial regression. Now, the theoretical framework that I used uh, was Kohlberg's six stages of moral development. Um, and that framework is fairly simple. Um, basically, Kohlberg's idea was the higher education level someone has, the higher their moral development um, is. And therefore, one would take away from that. Whereas, you know, if the higher educational level that someone's coming into law enforcement has, in theory, you would think that they would engage in less conflict. Next slide, please. All right, so participants and data sources. Um, what I used for the sample population of my study were all law enforcement um, officers hired from 2008 uh, to 2013 in the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office in Tampa, Florida. Now, you might be asking yourself a couple of questions. One, why did he select 2008 to 2013? 
Um, for the first point of that, there are several studies out there in research that show that you have to give officers time to have disciplinary issues. And I know that sounds silly, um, but obviously within the first year or two, there's going to be mistakes made, you know, uh, there's probationary periods and things like that. So I didn't want to focus on that. Uh, secondly, you don't want to get really into focusing on people that have been uh, with the department in 25 to 30 years, uh, because again, performance and, and activity and stuff might wane at that point. Um, and so this is kind of that period, five to 10 years roughly, uh, for when I did the study, that's kind of the sweet spot. Um, the total group was 288, um, which there was different uh, power of an, an analysis studies done, and that was a, a large enough sample to do a accurate uh, prediction, if you will. And specifically why I use the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. One, that's where I work. Um, obviously, when I collected the data, I made sure that it was anonymous, um, so there wouldn't be any issues with there. But the thing about the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, um, I believe currently now we're the ninth largest um, county law enforcement agency in the country. Uh, we have about 5,000 employees, about 3,000 are sworn. Um, so by no means are we the smallest, you know, with 10 or 20 people, but we're not the NYPD that has, you know, a tens and tens of thousands. So it's kind of right there in the middle. Um, how I got the data, I used ar archival data uh, from deputies, personnel files and internal affairs records. Um, although I work for the sheriff's office and I was able to get it uh, through that route, all the information that I obtained is something that would be available to anybody using a Freedom of Information Act request. Now you'll see to the right, uh, the educational levels. Um, I had to, again, since I'm doing a quantitative analysis, I had to break it down in numbers. So it, it seems kind of weird, but um, the numbers basically, the top line high school, those who were hired during that time, they're at a high school diploma or a GED, there was 19. Um, the next one is credits towards an associate's degree. Um, and then associate's degree, um, credits towards a bachelor's degree and a bachelor's degree. Um, during that time, there was one individual that had a, a Juris Doctorate and the one that had a master's, but they were kind of outliers. And so when I did the analysis, they were kind of outside that. Uh, one more reason why I started in 08 is because my agency, um, that's when they implemented a two-year educational requirement. Um, and so obviously the whole point here is to kind of look at requirements and I thought that that would be a good uh, time uh, to start. Now, you might be asking yourself why, if there's a two-year educational requirement, why are there people um, with less credits than that? Um, and the reason is there was an exemption for those who had military service. Um, but as you can see, the majority of people, even though the requirement was two years, they had a four-year degree. Next slide. All right, so the findings. And this is something that I could spend a long time going over, but the gist of it is after doing the correlation and regression analysis, um, there really wasn't a significant relationship um, between an inverse relationship, meaning there wasn't anything to say, okay, the more education level an officer has or the requirement for an agency has, the less problems. There really wasn't that. There, there was slight relationships, but nothing um, that I would like to call, or we would like to call as a whole, statistically significant. Um, since I already obtained the age, gender, race, and military service of those individuals I looked at, um, I did those analyses as well. And I found that there really wasn't any kind of um, statistically significant relationship with those either. Um, the most likely group that I found, if one had to, to kind of push it just as you're curious, uh, would be female officers. Um, there's a lot of research showing that generally females will use more forms of verbal de-escalation, which generally causes less problems, which in turn is um, it causes overall less lawsuits and money loss. So that's just, that's definitely a, a positive, but there was nothing in my actual study to be able to say that more emphasis put on hiring females. Next slide, please. All right, so recommendations. Um, Again, the, the main thing here is there's a lot of factors uh, that should go into considering um, when hiring people. And I think that should go without saying. Um, but the main thing is, is just to show that people shouldn't be eliminated um, just because they don't have a four-year degree or if they don't have military service. Um, I know it's hard for every agency around the country to hire people. I know that my agency, I think we're down 200 officers. Um, and even within the last couple of years, we still have the bachelor's degree requirement. However, if, if a new hire can 
um, provide documentation that they've had a full-time job for five years, then they could also have a chance to, to get a job. And so agencies have to, to be looking at a lot of things. They shouldn't just cut people off because they don't have that. Um, and again, this study shouldn't be used as a uh, justification to reduce the requirements either. I'm not saying that we should make it to where even if they don't have a high school diploma or something, that, that's not what this is about. It's just showing that that's not the only thing. I mean, there, there's other research showing that if an agency does have higher requirement, then it, it, it builds that prestige. More you know, people that are um, more highly educated, if you will, might be more apt to choose that agency to be around um, like minds. So it, it could be a, a thing that would uh, attract maybe a, a higher, um, I don't know, of documented, talented, you know, um, educational uh, background of individuals. However, it's going to limit the pool and therefore probably lead to less staffing. Next slide. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weatherington, and I'll continue. Um, my name is Darlene Cunningham. I am a graduate from Walden University, um, where I did study public policy and public administration. I am a Marine Corps veteran, and currently I do work for the Federal Bureau of Investigations. I've been working there for over 12 years now, um, covering multiple roles. Um, but my passion really has always involved issues surrounding recruitment, retention, diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion. Uh, well, as a result, I am excited to um, take the remaining minutes and share my research on the lived experiences of minority millennial interns who reject federal employment offers. So this will focus a little bit more on the retention area, but it will definitely touch on recruitment. So next slide, we'll go into the social problem. And the social problem is identified as the lack of diversity in federal organizations due to low levels in minority retention. Minority here includes women of all ethnicities, that is Asians, Latinas, Blacks, Whites, they all do bring a unique perspective to the table, which is evident in their glowing accomplishments highlighted throughout this month, which celebrates women history. The same can be said for men of color as they too bring that sought after value, which is amplified wherever diversity and inclusion are promoted. Now this leads into the research problem, which identifies a minority group as women and men of color who have completed their honors internship program. And this program um, is actually a primary hiring pool for many federal organizations. And it's within this group that the minority group are choosing to re reject the employment offers um, from these government organizations where they interned. Now the literature confirms that the lack of diversity in a federal organization to include Ballinger, um, who used the data from Brookings Institute, focusing on the FBI um, millennial interns in a relation to the national security, um, job satisfaction, and job turnover. Um, here, Ballinger noted that a lack of diversity in the sample with white individuals accounting for 75% of the FBI millennials, thus creating the foundation for answering the research question now, which is what is the perspective of minority interns who choose to leave federal organizations after completing their internship program. In relation to the impact of social change, a more visible, diverse executive and management leadership core, yes, um, stemming from an increase retention of minority millennial interns. Secondly, the federal organizations would depict a true representation of the local communities hosting their offices, wherein these federal organizations do look like the people just outside their doors. And thirdly, the third impact is that having a diverse representation of the communities within the federal organization could engender trust, partnership, 
and cooperation between the federal organizations and their local communities. Next slide. We move into the research design. And this is a qualitative study, which is based on a phenomenological design. Therefore, we are exploring the lived experiences of the former minority millennials who completed their internship program in organizations like the FBI. As the largest domestic federal investigative law enforcement organization in the country, they do boast a robust internship program. And here, that's the main reason that the FBI was chosen as a partner organization from which to pull the participants for this research. Concerning the theoretical framework, I chose Cox theory on creating the multicultural organization as the diversity elements aligned strongly with my research, including the benefits of diversity, such as the competitive advantage, enhanced creative performance, diversity of cognition and innovation, which dovetails into the apparent need to increase such diversity within these organizations in relation to recruitment. Further, um, correlation of this research in Cox's theory is evident in his exploration of high labor turnover. And he did make recommendations concerning managing this diversity. And um, of course, that would definitely lead to increased retention. Next slide. Now the participants and data sources. Um, the target population were former minority millennial interns who completed the internship program between 2015 to 2018 with one set being um, personnel who chose to reject um, government offers and the other set those who accepted the offers. Other participants, LinkedIn, FBI emails, referrals, they were all utilized. A small sample size of 10 participants were selected for purposes of sampling and the demography of the participants is shown in figure one um, with two females, one African-American, one Latina, eight males, four African-American, two Asians, one Latino, and one Middle Eastern. Next slide. Now the findings of the data, um, from the data collected, there emerged six themes with respective sub-themes, of course. Um, the first theme showed all participants had motivations to serve as the participants expressed to cause, to, to, to work on causes um, bigger than themselves. Um, they wanted also to work in a renowned organization such as the FBI um, with a notable brand and in, a, a, well, a law enforcement community, of course. And as well as there were some participants who wanted to embark on a lifelong career dream um, of working in law enforcement and being a part of a bureau family. Um, secondly, expectations of interns. That was a second theme that shone through. Um, one participant, even though um, he expressed didn't have um, any preconceived expectation, but expressed real curiosity in wanting to absorb everything that he could um, that was available to him. But all the other participants, of course, they did have a preconceived notion what they envisioned their internship would be. Some expressed that they wanted to discern a viable potential career. Others expected to not only gain experience, exposure into the FBI's world, but also to build a network while there. Additionally, being mentored to include minority mentorship, that was also specified. And uh, the altruistic civic duty working um, where they couldn't make a difference, that was also expected by some of the participants. It is definitely noteworthy that while some participants who rejected permanent job offers 
did so due to unmet expectations. There were those whose expectations were actually met, yet they chose to still reject job offers. And this will come up later on in the next slide. Moving on to the third theme um, is internship challenges, which was experienced by all participants. Some participants tried to find a balance between internship responsibilities and schoolwork to prevent burnout. Um, participants also viewed non-disclosure of sensitive information about work to their families as a challenge, um, understandably so. Also, um, adapting to the organizational culture of the FBI posed a challenge for some of the participants who had to quickly acclimatize to the organization's challenges, policies, and expectations. Networking for some proved intimidating as they were forced to um, kind of get out of their comfort zone and others expressed they felt underutilized at times due to their limited accesses as well as involvement as interns. Um, administrative challenges did shed some light on uh, areas of communication requiring more flexibility and cogent dissemination of information um, from administrators to um, the internship population. Sorry. Continuing with the findings collected, we continue with the next theme, which is realized rewards. And here participants identified inclusivity as a reward that they experienced during their internship on their embedded squads. They also felt rewarded when they did meaningful work, which made a difference. Um, some, some, as um, some of these experiences led to arrests, and there were other meaningful experiences um, where they would be allowed to participate in external recruiting endeavors and representing minority groups. The realities of finance was directly related to interns who chose to leave um, due to financial need. And the last theme that emerged beyond finances resulted in sub-themes that not found in literature yet were directly related to some participants rejecting permanent job offers such as relocation option inflexibility in tandem with financial difficulties of relocating to new offices out of state. Um, there were some participants who admittedly were not mentored throughout their internship due to lack of mentorship programs in their location. And therefore they had a difficult time acclimatizing. For some participants, um, who saw internship as a training ground to gain exposure and hone their skills, they chose to embark on other career possibilities outside the organization where they interned. And um, preserving the stability of family, um, not uprooting their family to go out of state for a job offer, that was also um, found in the data. Um, which resulted in a rejection of offers. Lastly, um, the expectation of most of these interns who rejected job offers were met, which brought awareness to the fact that met expectations do not guarantee retention outcomes. That's something that um, was surprising about the discovery. And um, moving on to the next slide for recommendations. So recommendations based on the findings, which included instituting a bureau-wide minority mentorship program and extending it to all interns to aid in broadening the intern scope of reference on the organization, its culture, and career opportunities. Secondly, to incorporate the mentorship program as part of each supervisor's 
performance appraisal so supervisors can continue to hone their mentorship and leadership skills. Thirdly, establish a recall list with names of interns who reject permanent job offers due to financial difficulties of relocating to new offices. Um, therefore, whenever entry-level vacancies become available in proximity to where these interns reside, they will be one of the first candidates to be recalled um, if available for those openings. Another recommendation is relocation incentive. Um, that was recommended for interns who were offered permanent positions to relocate to either a higher cost area or if the office exceeded over a thousand mile radius from the original office where they interned. Also having interns participate in at least one recruiting or community event with the division's recruiter as a way of representing their communities and help recruit for diversity like themselves um, was also recommended. And the last recommendation um, was to market work schedule flexibility as an option transcending COVID-19 for recruitment and retention of diversity and a way of competing with the private sector for the generational millennials whose aspirations are known to favor freedoms and flexibility. Next slide. Okay, so that completes the presentation. Thank you very much for your time and the, the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, Thank you so much. Over to you, the moderator. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Weatherington for your awesome finale to um, our research symposium sessions this afternoon. Um, we do have just a couple of minutes left, um, but we wanna take the opportunity to um, allow folks to ask a few questions if they have them. So please feel free to ask questions or post comments um, in the chat if you have them for either of our um, presenters. Um, you are getting a lot of kudos in the chat um, about this wonderful presentation. Um, Dr. Blackman does have a question for you. Um, what do you think is the one thing most police recruiters miss when trying to hire new officers? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I apologize, I was trying Sure, to no problem. What do you think is the one or is one thing that most police recruiters miss when they're trying to hire new officers? Um, that's a tough one. I, I think, I think it's all about keeping an open mind. I know that when my agency had to, to get a lot more recruiters, because obviously if you're trying to get more people in the door, you need more recruiters, um, to try to get rid of certain notions, um, that recruiters had, for example, even when I started, there, there was a misconception about females and them not being able to do the job and things like that, which we all obviously all know is incorrect um, because law enforcement is not the same as it was back in the day. So if you get somebody like that, that's a recruiter who maybe has those, those biases or, or preconceived notions, maybe it's going to sway them saying, okay, this person's good to go or not. Um, and so I, I can't think of anything specific. To me, it, it's kind of more um, on the agency to make sure we get those recruiters who have an open mind that try to find uh, the best you know, people for the job because we all know there's not a perfect uh, law enforcement officer. They come in all shapes and sizes. The main goal, as long as they're able to keep the community safe, that's really all that matters. And I'd like to jump on that as well real quickly because the Marine Corps does, they, not the Marine Corps, but they, um, the FBI does have a cadre for um, police officers. And one of the things I know we benefit from is diversifying the recruiting staff that goes out um, because of course each person brings a different perspective and believe it or not, um, a lot of times we fall in the bias where we try and um, when we're drawn to persons who um, kind of remind us of ourselves or you know fit a certain profile. So having a diverse um, recruiting group out there you know, thinking of um, other areas that we particularly probably not looking at um, will definitely um, help in the process for that. 
Thanks for your question. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, I do want to be cognizant of giving everybody a break before we hopefully join then the Reflect and Connect session. And we are a few minutes over. Um, there was just one comment about recruiters having to be knowledgeable of what is needed to make um, the department successful and find the best candidate. And then um, Dr. McMillan, perhaps you can um, pose this question um, during the Reflect and Connect session. Um, with our presenters, um, but I will send it to both presenters just so they have it to kind of ruminate on um, beforehand. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Weatherington. We really appreciate your presentation today, and we look forward to seeing all of you in about six minutes in our Reflect and Connect session to round out this amazing symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.